Arriving at Mark's town home, Johnny jumped out of the truck and ran to the front door. Dancing in place, he rubbed his hands to stay warm. At least this place isn't half bad that I thought it'd be. Hurry up, it's freezing! Putting his hand in front of his nose, from the doorway Mark could smell the young teen. Dirt, unwashed body, and the sweetness of what he'd eaten before clung to this person. His matted hair was dull and greasy. The shower's upstairs. The guest room is next to that. Just put your clothes outside the door and I'll wash them for you. I'll bring you something to change in and some extra towels. That's great! Can I have something to eat too? Wait, do you even have food in this place? I'll order some pizza. Please stay in the house. After ordering pizza, Mark worked in his home office. He immediately smelled shampoo. Commentators on television were talking about the stock market and investments. What? The Fed dropped interest rates again? What are they thinking? He always used glasses, but Mark had to remember where he kept his dishes. They were easy to find since he didn't have any kitchen appliances in his cupboards. Blowing off a layer of dust, Mark washed one. Just in time, a pizza delivery man was at the door. I hope you like pepperoni. You bet I do. His fear of Mark temporarily forgotten, Johnny wolfed down five slices. He rose to go back in front of the television. So, what were you watching? Some business report. It has a bunch of old people talking, mostly. Mark raised an eyebrow. He was very curious about subjects most teens his age weren't. You follow that stuff? Sure. I want to be a rich stockbroker someday. Or maybe an economist. Trading seems easy, but it's the rest that's hard. Where did you learn about stocks? I panhandled by a pawn shop. They always kept their TV to this station. Now I can't turn on the TV without looking at it once. It feels weird if I don't. Don't you watch shows that are normal for a teenager? I watch cartoons. Sometimes I watch anime. Good. At least you watch something besides business news. So where do you go to school? School? I don't go to school. I left home and no school will take someone without an address or a parent to register them. Too many questions. Why'd you run away from home? I don't want to talk about it. Mark silently waited. If the kid wanted to talk, he eventually would. I have a good reason not to go back. Mom's in jail. Dad left long ago. And they wanted me to go live with a friend of theirs. But he drinks all the time. It sucks over there. Mark, thanks for letting me stay here. We need to get you back in school. You seem bright. Hate that to be wasted. If you need an address, you can use mine. If you'd like, you may stay here. Promise not to tell anyone I'm a vampire. Deal? He couldn't believe what he was offering, but the young tween just looked so lost. It's a deal. I wasn't sure about you at first, but it's warm here and you seem normal. I mean, for a vampire, I guess. I'll stay, and I'll keep your secret. I mean, I wouldn't want to get bit or whatever you do to those you don't like. The tween might not like to hear that Mark stakes his enemies, but he kept that bit for himself. And I'll promise too, no biting, no changing, no asking for blood. Johnny smiled. Okay, this could work, but getting the society to like it would be a different story. An emergency meeting was called. The entire Society of the Arts assembled at Miss Violet's home. President Belmonte furrowed his brow, crossed his arms and wouldn't move from where he quietly sat in the corner. The Spanish master's expression darkened as he listened to Mark's explanation. The tyro was dancing on the edge of breaking the code. Mm -hmm. Professor Mickelson also didn't seem pleased. Looking around the room, 
Mark noticed that there wasn't one warm face present. They didn't take the news well. A human who learned about vampires was now boarding in his house. And that person was also a minor. Professor Mickelson slammed his hand on Mrs. Barlett's mahogany table. A vampire shouldn't be raising a human child! I'm completely against this! He was furious. Mark tensed, ready to bolt from the room in case the enforcer decided to bite, or worse, stake him. The other society members stayed silent and watched the exchange. Mark hoped one of them would speak up for him, but he knew that they probably felt the same way about Johnny. I'm 33 now. I'm my own adult, and if this kid needs help, I'll give it to him. So now that you've matured this much, you're starting to have regrets about not having a family. This isn't the way to have one, Tyro. What on earth were you thinking? What if this child thinks that being a vampire is normal? You'll end up brainwashing him to believe that he should be one. Is that what you want? Is that your plan? To raise your own apprentice? You have a big head if you think you're ready for an apprentice, Tyro. You're supposed to wait until after your hundredth year before taking someone under your wing. Only in rare and dire circumstances do vampires break this tradition. But raising a child along vampires? This is unacceptable! Please tell me you thought this through. I think it's better for his soul if he stays a human. Hey! I'm standing right here! Don't worry about it. I'm tough. Don't worry about me wanting to be a vampire, mister. Mark promised me that he'd never bite me, and he'd never turn me. Is that true? It is. Give me some credit, Mickelson. It's not like I wanted to start training my own Tyro so soon after you changed me. Johnny just needs a place to stay, and in exchange, he'll keep our secret. The kid paused as he looked around. Some emotion flickered across his face. He squared his shoulders. I'm not stupid. Hell yes, I'll keep your secret. Language, please. Belmonte looked intense. He quietly spoke. Johnny, was it? If you ever decide to tell our secret, or decide to start hunting us, you won't see another sunrise. What are you saying? He'd never... Silence! You're blinded by his age. However, I've lived long enough to know human nature never changes. Will he keep your confidence? Will it slip someday to a future lover or to a friend over a few drinks? This is how we make our enemies. It always starts with a whisper, a rumor. You've already made your mistake. You went over my head. I welcomed you into the society, but remember, the Society of the Arts is still mine. These are my friends, and I'll do anything to protect them. I know Mickelson feels the same way. It's nothing personal, child. It's just that I've had the experience of being hunted in my lifetime, and I'd rather not repeat it. Got it. I won't tell a soul, I promise. I'll keep you to your word. Dismissed. Johnny waited outside. It was Mark's turn next. Mickelson, you may be my friend, but your Tyro has done something to jeopardize the entire society. Mark, I want to know what your real plans are for him. Real plans? I want him to grow up to be a normal teenager. Well, as normal as it can be, having a vampire as a guardian. I really don't think he wants to be one of us. He should have seen his face when he asked me not to make him a vampire. So he fears us. We can use this to our advantage. What if this child eventually does want to be one of us? He might become confused to what's normal. He might start thinking it is his right after he's lived with us so long. Then I won't change him, Professor. You know that I have questions about our souls. I'd never risk his fate like that. But if he does someday ask, it'd be the society's decision. He'd be part of our family then, 
although I'd rather have him as a human than a vampire. Your recklessness has gone to epic proportions today, Tyro. I'm both impressed and disappointed. I've always admired your ability to think impulsively, but this goes beyond the pale. Fine, keep him, raise him, but the consequences are yours. I have only one demand. When it is time for the society to hibernate, you shall join us without argument. Mark nodded. <clears throat> there was really nothing to say after that bomb he'd left the society. Well, that was more than enough surprises for one day. One problem so. Who was he kidding? Mark hadn't the first clue on how to raise a tween. He was going to do his best, for Johnny's sake. Johnny stayed with Mark, and Mark kept his promise to never drink his blood. The society managed to enroll him in a private school where they'd previously donated money. Finally, Johnny would be off the streets and have an education. At school, he was a success. He made friends and excelled in math. Everyone in the Society of the Arts fell in love with Johnny, and the kid finally found a place to call his own. Mark and Johnny spent the day shopping downtown. The sun shone brightly overhead. Mark frequently paused beneath the downtown awnings. He'd forgotten his sunglasses, and the bright sun hurt his eyes. Carrying two bags of clothes for Johnny for the coming school year, Mark tried not to think about their price tag. Johnny's growth spurt costed a small fortune. Are there any more vampire groups besides the Society of the Arts? Quickly looking around, Mark checked that no one could eavesdrop. He was surprised. Once Johnny started living under his roof, he rarely asked about vampires. It was like the kid was afraid to know. President Belmonte's warning must have struck home. Yes, there are others. I just stopped by one yesterday while you were at school. As you know, Mickelson's training me to be the enforcer. So sometimes we check on vampires who are... slipping. Not really following the code as best as they should. I don't think it's good for you to know more about my line of work. They said you're the enforcer's apprentice. What's it like? Have you killed other vampires? Mark's jaw clenched. He stayed silent. That information could be fatal to the boy if someone interrogated him. He didn't bother mentioning that fact. Okay. Don't talk about it. What about other vampire groups? How many vampires are there? Another dangerous question. Too many. One in twenty? More like one vampire exists per 50,000 people in the United States. I don't know about other places. And not every vampire is friendly. Some think humans are only food. Some hate humans and others are hermits. If any vampire besides the society approaches you, you come straight to me. Mark had told him the last part before, but he wanted the kid to remember. His curiosity wasn't always a good thing. Too many questions were dangerous in his line of work. As they passed by Dive's pub, Mark suggested to stop inside. As the kid ordered a cream soda, Mark ordered a glass of milk and they talked about normal things like if Johnny wanted to play any sports in school, if he had a girlfriend yet, and anything else not vampire related. Eventually, Johnny sat quietly and stared at his food. It was unusual for him to be so introspective. Breeding wasn't normal for the talkative kid. <sighs> I can't stand it. Why are you so quiet? What are you thinking about? You wouldn't shut up earlier. I was remembering my gramps. Do you want to live with your grandfather? Is he still alive? Do you want to contact him? Maybe you could stay with him. It'd be a normal and safer life. Are you trying to get rid of me? He's gone now. Died when I was still young. He was a nice grandpa. Someday, 
I want to be a grandpa like him. I think you're getting too far ahead of yourself, kid. You're too young to worry about stuff like families. Then Johnny looked up with Mark with pity, and Mark felt his smile vanish. But your story is kind of sad, isn't it? Here I'm talking about school life and my future. And then I remember that you'll never have the same kind of life as me. That was taken from you. You'll never grow old or have grandkids. It was like a blow to the gut. Johnny was very intuitive. Mark had never thought about grandchildren, but he was right. In a way, Johnny would be the closest person Mark would have for a son. It would be many years before the code would allow him to take an apprentice. And would he want one? Having a real family was different. Mark's father wasn't there for him once he got remarried, but that didn't mean all families were like that. Many were happy and loved each other. Mark shook away thoughts of what he would miss and tried to sound happy. Is that what you're worried about? Talk as much as you want. I'll listen. I decided to become a vampire on my own. That choice was a long time ago. That afternoon, Mrs. Violet called with a surprise. She wanted to take Johnny and Mark to something cultured because... The boy needs to see something besides the basketball games you drag him to. The Society of the Arts sponsored the local production of Faust, and they had an orchestra seating. Mark gave in. Besides, who'd push away free tickets? Mark only cringed that it was an opera. And not any opera. The serious kind with an overpowering tenor lead. Mark could hear the long notes now. My mom promised to take me to a musical one day. But I never had the chance to go. Are you sure you don't want to wear anything else? Nope. A bow tie's fine. No one will notice what I wear anyways. Mark didn't argue, but he was sure the society would say something. But they were to go to the outdoor amphitheatre, so it wouldn't be expected that everyone would wear something formal. Mark tried to explain that operas were much different than musicals, but he didn't mind. Johnny got his wish. They were going to see Faust. Meeting at the amphitheatre, Mrs. Violet dressed elegantly. President Belmonte constantly stayed attentively next to her. He pulled out her seat, rose to get her a drink. He did all these things. But whenever she looked away, he'd watch her. There was something more than friendship in his gaze. See there? That's the violin chair I was telling you about. That woman has talent. Charlie was always spying new musicians for the Society of the Arts to support. Today, they stopped by the theatre not only because they were patrons, but they were also there to observe the new musician. As patrons of the arts, they wanted to encourage their city to continue to support live performances. This brings back memories. I remember when you saw the picture of Dorian Gray, and I had asked if vampires were real or just a myth. It's ironic how things in life come full circle. You'll see a lot of that in this new life. It's true. Days seem to fly when you have centuries of memories. However, no matter what happens, human nature never changes. People will always desire power, youth, and fame. The oldest appearing vampire squinted her eyes at the twin sitting next to them. I know that he's your ward and that it is none of my business. But shouldn't the boy be wearing something a little nicer? He's sitting next to us, Noel. I'm afraid that he will stick out like a sore thumb. Inwardly, Mark cringed. You're right. I tried to warn him. 
As long as he is aware that his choices reflect on us. It was going to be a fantastic performance. It had been a long time since the society met together somewhere other than Mrs. Violet's doily filled house. Johnny bounced in his seat as the warm-up notes came from the orchestra pit. A familiar voice whispered nearby. Mark turned towards the feminine sound. Gentoo sat with Damien nearby. Sucking in a breath, Mark faced forwards. I saw them when we came in. It's a public event. They can have their date here just like anyone else. Don't draw their attention further. Mark nodded. An opera didn't seem like Damien's taste. Mark's thoughts wandered to his memories of the first time he saw the House of Skulls. There at the picture of Dorian Gray as well. Faust's dark theme did seem like a good choice for them. The audience hushed. The lights dimmed and thick burgundy curtains rose. Faust's dark theme unnerved Mark. The knowledgeable scholar seeks for more than just what life offers. His life sinks into boredom and ennui. Dissatisfied, he tries to commit suicide and fails. Then, a devil tempts him with a deal. You can have all of your desires in exchange for your little soul. Mark shuddered. The similarities in his own life were too close for his own comfort. He glanced at Johnny, wondering if the precocious kid would realise it too. Johnny's eyes lit up as he enjoyed the show. Half the time, his mouth was open as he listened to the high-pitched sopranos. He was the happiest Mark had seen him in weeks. Mark was glad that the kid enjoyed the musical, although Johnny didn't care for the moral crisis theme. Professor Mickelson noticed his Tyro's discomfort and glanced at him from time to time. He opened his mouth as if to say something, but Johnny squirmed again. Both Mark and the Professor frowned. Can't help it! Gotta go pee! Don't worry, I know the way back! He hopped out of his seat and left. The smoky stage made a dramatic end of the first act. The intermission began and the elegantly dressed crowd switched as they stretched and went for a couple of sessions. Mrs. Violet folded her opera glasses neatly into her handbag. Even though they sat in the orchestra row, she still peered through the lenses to get a closer look at the singers. Her gift was spotting someone who, years later, would become a success and land a lead role in one of the bigger cities. They are doing a wonderful job, aren't they? I'll add that it's so good to see Johnny interested in the arts. The kid knows what's good music. He surprises me all the time, but his biggest love is business. He always thinks about the stock market and makes different strategies for it. He writes down how he would like to invest and compares the numbers a week later. He's gotten pretty good at comparing numbers. He is a fine boy. I must admit I was concerned when you first brought home that orphan. But he is nice and usually polite. Now, if only he can learn to dress sharper. He has been gone for a while, hasn't he? Mark carefully stepped around the audience members. Once out of the aisles of seating, Mark pushed against the flow of people. As the crowd began to thin, there was still no sign of Johnny. Maybe the kid was buying concessions. Mark arrived at an empty bar. Instead of hearing Johnny's voice, the sound of the orchestra came. They were about to start the next act. Mark had to find Johnny quickly, or otherwise they would not be allowed to return to their seats and interrupt the performance. A soft, quick thumping came from a side walkway. Mark recognised that sound. Fear. A small heart was wildly beating. His short figure was surrounded by the House of Skulls. 
Leaning over Johnny with each palm against a wall, Damien trapped the scared boy. Damien's face held a cruel smile as he spoke dangerously close to Johnny's neck. What Mark heard next made his blood chill. If Mark doesn't drink from you now, he'll drink from you later. And bet that he wants you to be his Tyro. Why else would a vamp go out of his way to be so nice to a teenager? Remember, brat, if Mark doesn't change you, I will. That is the price for not paying with your blood. And when I change you, it will be the worst thing you ever felt. And I'll enjoy it. Johnny's eyes widened. That jerk wasn't going to bite Johnny. Not if Mark could stop him. As soon as Johnny saw his vampire friend, he burst into tears. With his teeth bared, Mark lunged. Zenzu grabbed his arms and held him back. Careful, Mark. This boy should hear what Damien has to say. He's too young to bring him into our world. You should have told him the truth. He told us you weren't planning on making him a donor or a vampire. We both know the code. I don't believe the Enforcer's pet would break rules like we do. Get out of my way! Pushing Zenshu off him, Mark stepped past her and grabbed Damien by the collar. What did you do to Johnny? Nothing. I was just talking to him. Remember what I said, Squirt. Johnny trembled as he slid down the wall. He pissed his pants. No one scares my boy. You bastard! Speaking through his teeth, Mark hit as hard as he could with his free hand. Stumbling backwards, Damien scowled as he wiped his bleeding lip. Zenzu pulled Mark off Damien before he could hit the jerk twice. Pushing away, Mark positioned himself between the vampires and the kid. If you ever come near him again, I'll kill you! We did nothing to get so angry over. I just told him the truth. Damn, this is not how I wanted my evening to go, love. We missed the second half of the show. Happy you've got your answer? Very. Don't worry. I'll make it up to you later. Mark stood in front of Johnny for a long while, guarding him until he could no longer hear the skull's sluggish vampire hearts. Finally, he faced the wide-eyed boy. Taking the boy's wrist, he gently turned them. Good. There were no pairs of red marks. He looked at the back of Johnny's neck. It was clean. Johnny flinched. He was still trembling. Did Damien scare him that badly? Mark couldn't blame Johnny's reaction, but when Johnny glanced up at Mark, there was fear. You above everyone else have no reason to be afraid of me. I'll never break my promise. Red face, he nodded. It was too late to go back to the performance and tell the professor they were leaving. Mark sent his progenitor a text message and said, they went home. Dumb things on street So many dumb things on street Dumb things